It was an evening in November 1999. Michaelmas term still had half its life to run. The same, alas, couldn't be said of poor Philip Skello. A potential new benefactor, Lord Goldhooper, had suddenly appeared, offering the college some five million pounds. And the master, Sir William Buckmoat, had invited a few people to dinner to entertain him. As college nurse, I had no real place at the table, but Lady B had begged me to balance the predominantly male guest list. Imogen, dear, I'll be the only woman. Do please help me out. Oh, yes, death was sly. Not one of us suspected the moment when, masked by the more or less idle chatter, he slid in amongst us. But, but what is uh, the Wyndham case, Master? Would you believe me, Lord Goldhooper, if I told you it was a rather large and somewhat unusual bookcase? Oh, isn't that rather misleading, William, dear? <laughs> no, Master, does it do justice to one of St Agatha's most respected traditions? Oh, come off it, Crispin. I'm afraid, Lord Goldhooper, that Mr Mountnessing must be considered somewhat biased. He holds the rather arcane and much too highly rewarded post of Wyndham Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Rumbold, on the other hand, is what might be termed St Agatha's Common or Garden Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> and, I may add, much less richly remunerated. Oh, I, I seem to have stirred up a hornet's nest, Master. I assure you I had no intention ah, dispute hallowed by time, Lord Goldhooper. Indeed, three centuries. The Wyndham case is one of those rather embarrassing pieces of baggage from a bygone era that so many of our Cambridge colleges are encumbered with. I'm afraid Lord Goldhooper will be getting a misleading impression of how much we welcome the quest of the college and how scrupulous we are in carrying out the terms attached to them. Uh, and that would never do, would it, Mr Malmessy? In view of the rather special conditions I'd attach to my own donation. Actually, Lord Goldhooper, I was wondering if you include medicine among the subjects you'd prescribe under the terms of your bequest. As our college nurse, Miss Kwai would be considered to have a vested interest in medicine. Mm. Uh, Kwai? An unusual name? Saxon, I believe. And from this part of the world, Kwai's a village in East Anglia. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Miss Kwai, I'm afraid I class theoretical medicine along with all the other soft sciences, <laughs> sociology, economics, mm -hmm. and the rest of the tommy rot that passes for academic mm -hmm. study these days. <laughs> I want my three chairs and nine scholarships to advance the sort of science capable of returning precise answers to precise questions. Physics, astronomy, inorganic chemistry. In fact, Lord Goldhooper, your approach closely parallels Christopher Wyndham's. He was a Ptolemaic astronomer, and he also imposed certain conditions when he bequeathed St Agatha's his unique library of works on that branch of science. Uh, perhaps I should explain that the Wyndham case was given to the college as a complete library, together with the rather magnificent oak bookcase that holds it. You must come and see it. It's two stories high, with steps at one end, and even a little gallery. <laughs> Fortunately, we have a room large enough to contain it. You said your benefactor imposed certain conditions. Ah, uh, yes. Well, Wyndham lived to see the values he believed in being systematically destroyed. <laughs> Isaac Newton's Principia was taking the world by storm, and the Ptolemaic system was in disrepute. Above everything, Wyndham wanted the body of knowledge that he'd gathered together to be preserved precisely as he left it. Mm -hmm. So... He attached some of the strangest conditions to his bequest that you could imagine. For example, the Wyndham room is to be kept locked at all times, except when the librarian is present, which leads to rather restricted visiting hours, wouldn't you say, Crispin? And then there's the system of audits. <laughs> or audits? Yes, the complete library has to be audited within prescribed times uh, to check that the contents are intact. Oh, and don't forget the key. Oh, <laughs> yes, Lady P. <laughs> Wyndham himself designed the lock, and there's only one key. I keep it on me at all times. Ah, but there is a second key. It's held by the <laughs> auditor, whoever he or she may be. Let, let me explain. We don't know what arrangements Wyndham made for this audit. All we do know is that it's to be carried out once in every hundred years, but on a day chosen at random. If everything is in order, the college is to have a feast, paid for 
out of the bequest. And if not? Well, if ever any book is found to be missing, the college is to lose all benefit under the will. The whole bequest is to be disposed of. And since, as well as his library, Wyndham left us a great deal of property in and around Cambridge, its value today is almost incalculable. That would represent pretty near total financial ruin for the college. But since St Agatha seems to be flourishing, I take it the audit has always turned up trumps. Mm -hmm. uh, how many have there been? Well, Christopher Wyndham died on the 8th of January, 1700. The first audit was carried out some 35 years later. Mm. <laughs> there was a most splendid feast involving five dozen roast swans. <laughs> then everyone seems to have forgotten all about it. So when the second audit took place, it caused more than a little surprise. Yes, yes. it was carried out just a hundred years ago, mm. in December 1899. The library was found to be complete, and there was another feast. Mm. But that audit was out of time, surely. More than a century had elapsed since the last one. No, Lord Goldhooper. The crucial timing stems from Wyndham's death, so an audit must occur within each successive 100 years, starting from the 8th of January, 1700. Oh, goodness. William, dear, have you thought? It's now November 1999. That means there has to be an audit within the next six or seven weeks. Mm, what yes. if the arrangements Wyndham made way back in 1700 have lapsed? <laughs> Let's hope they have, Miss Quay. That had put an end to all this nonsense. No audit, and the terms of the bequest can be set aside. All the same, I don't think we should take any chances. Uh, I assume the Wyndham case is complete, Crispin. I can assure you about that, Master. <laughs> but, Crispin, didn't you tell me you'd sent a few volumes away to be rebound? What if the auditor had turned up while they were gone? Oh. What if he turns up tomorrow? Oh, oh my <laughs> God! The binders had those volumes for nearly six months. Oh, come, come, we mustn't bore our guest with this sort of thing. Lord Goldhooper, by tradition we take port and dessert in the combination room on the other side of Fountain Court. Shall we make our way across? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, I do not want the volumes to fall apart. But how long do they have to remain in the presses? How long? No, no, that'll never do. You must be quicker than that. But, but, uh, I, Madam, I'm totally indifferent to the technicalities of your profession. All I can tell you is that we must have those three books back in St Agatha's at the earliest possible moment. No, I expect you to deliver them here yourself. Gentlemen, yes. ladies and gentlemen, I've asked you to take a glass of sherry with me this morning for a very good reason, and it has nothing to do with the millennium. Those celebrations are behind us, I'm rather pleased to say, and we'll have to wait most of another thousand years before they're repeated. No, today is the 9th of January in the year of our Lord 2000. In other words, the 300th anniversary of Wyndham's death has come and gone, and I'm happy to report that no auditor has turned up to inspect the library. In short, the terms of the Wyndham bequest have now been breached by whoever holds the trusteeship. St Agatha's is therefore released from the onerous threat that has rested on us for the past 300 years, ever since the death on the 8th of January, 1700, of our benefactor, Christopher Wyndham, whose health I now propose. Christopher Wyndham. Christopher Wyndham! <laughs> Imogen Quai? Miss Quai, please, you must come at once, please. 
Something terrible's happened. Where are you, Master? In the Wyndham case. Do hurry, Miss Quay. I pushed open the heavy doors of the Wyndham library to find the Master and Crispin Mount Nessing crouched by one of the tables. At their feet, spread eagled on the floor, lay a young man. Under his head, a large pool of bright red blood had flowed widely around the leg of the table. It was edged now with a darkening rim, like an island on an old map. I can't understand it. I can't understand it. Excuse me. Miss Quiet. Philip, isn't it? Uh, Philip Skello, first year. I found him like this when I unlocked the library this morning. We can't rouse him. Let me see. Too late, I'm afraid. Dead? I'm afraid so. Master, I'm sorry, but you must call the police. This looks like murder. Oh, surely not. He just fell and... I don't see how a fall could have done this. But it's not for us to decide. We just call the police. Master, we must absolutely call them at once. Shall I? I do know a detective sergeant in the Cambridge station. I could talk to him. Oh, Miss Quay, would you? Sergeant Mike Parsons, please. Who may I say wants him? Imogen Quay. Imogen who? Quiet. Q-U-Y. Uh, just a minute. Oh, for goodness sake. Come on, come on. <sighs> Imogen, what's up? Oh, Mike, thank goodness. There's been an accident. What sort of accident? Where? Here in St Agatha's. I, I say accident, but I, I think it might be foul play. It's an undergraduate. Is he dead? I'm afraid so. Do nothing. Touch nothing. I'll be over ASAP. Thanks, Mike. I'll meet you in the porter's lodge. So bright. The first pupil from his school ever to make it to Cambridge. I had high hopes of a first-class degree from him. Now, who on earth could have done such a thing, Sergeant? First thing, Sir William, is to find out why. Who usually follows quite quickly. Hello, what's this book on the floor? Does it come from one of these shelves? Well, let me see. Nova et Antuca Cosmologia. Yes, it belongs to the Wyndham case. Valuable? Fairly? Not by any means the best book here. This room kept locked? Always, except when I'm here. It's a condition of the Wyndham bequest. Imogen, can we come in? Fran, of course. And Emily Stody, isn't it? You had that, that sprain last term. I take it your ankle's better. Well, sit down, Emily. Now, what's the matter? <laughs> Someone heard her bawling away in the loo. She wouldn't come out. It took ages. Now, what's this all about, Emily? Can I help? I'm all right. Is it about Philip Skello? Were you fond of him? Philip? Why on earth should I be fond of him? I hardly knew him, only at parties. Miss Quiet, people are saying he's been murdered. That's not true, is it? I honestly don't know what happened, Emily. The police are here to find out. Now, why don't you go and have a lie down? I'll give you something to help you relax. You'll feel better after a rest. I can't do that. I've had the lab all set up for an experiment this afternoon. I'll cancel it for you. You just go and sleep it off. Sorry I'm late. The police wanted another chat. I'll put some supper together in a jiff. Oh, oh Fran. <laughs> oh, you've got it already. Oh, you are a dear. Well, you have to keep on the best side of your landlady. Oh, Fran, you <laughs> and Professor Wiley may be my lodgers, but oh, there's something really nasty about that word. <laughs> Only kidding. Come on, sit down and tuck in. Oh, thank you. <sighs> Now, you mentioned the police. Any developments? Well, in a way, I know the detective sergeant, Mike Parsons. We were on a training course together a few years ago. He came to see me just as I was getting ready to leave. Are you off duty, Mike? I can offer whiskey or tea, if you prefer. Am I off duty? 
Uh, rather depends. Chief doesn't know why I'm calling on you, but if he did, I'd be for it. Mm. Before you start, I'd better say that college medical records are private property. Mm. A warrant to see them, Mike, even if we are old friends. Well, now, perhaps I would like a cup of tea after all. Mm. And while you're getting it, maybe I'll do some thinking aloud. I take it I don't need a warrant for that. <laughs> Think away. Milk and sugar? Please. Imogen, you saw the body, so you know there's a time of death problem. Rigor setting in, but blood still wet. Mm. Yes, yes, I realise. But Philip Skello wasn't haemophiliac, Mike. I'd have known about that. Perhaps the path report will cast some light. Mm. But, but it wasn't that I wanted to think about. We're having trouble interviewing victims' known associates, otherwise known as undergraduates in this blessed college. Mm. I thought you might be able to help. Bet they all adore you. Oh, I doubt that. But I'll do what I can. The sooner you get to the bottom of this, the better for everyone. Put it bluntly, they're being bloody uncooperative. Except on one topic, the victim. A weed, it appears. Didn't mm. roll, didn't play rugger. A swart. Dubious honesty, too. Oh, surely not. A perfectly nice young man. Why does everyone think he wasn't honest? He seems to have had more money this term than his so-called friends reckon he should. Now, if you'd said the opposite, he was sharing a set. What? A set of rooms, that is, uh. with Jack Taverham. And Jack is seriously wealthy. Money to burn. I gather Skello's presence was rather an embarrassment to Taverham. I think they both asked to be moved, but the bursar wasn't having any of it. No, the college deliberately encourages people from different backgrounds to mix. Philip Skello was a grammar school boy from Yorkshire. Taverham is from a, a big public school. The bursar told them there was no other accommodation available and advised them to make the best of it for the remainder of this year. So they were stuck with each other? Yes. It seems that Skello was a pain in the neck at Taverham's parties, and I gather Taverham threw a hell of a party the night before last. People don't get murdered for whinging at parties. Yes, but no one, and I mean no one, can remember whether Skello was there or not, mm. or so they claim. And if he was, everybody's absolutely certain they didn't talk to him. Why not ask Taverham? Love to, but we can't find him. You wouldn't know where he might be, I suppose. I could ask around. Would you do that, Imogen? I'd be very grateful. You wouldn't happen to know where Jack Taverham's got to, I suppose, Fran? Haven't a clue. Fran, that party on the 15th. Why won't people help the police? You can't blame them. I don't understand. The police. They give young people a hard time. Break up their raves, frisk them for drugs. Some people are actually afraid of them. Oh, Fran, come on. We're talking about my friend Mike Parsons and his attempt to find out who murdered one of you. I think they want to know if Philip was at the party. He was. I saw him there. And when he left? That I don't know. I didn't see him go. The rooms were packed and I wasn't paying much attention to Philip. Well, couldn't he have just gone to his bedroom and, and closed the door? Well, no. His room would have been, well, in use. Occupied. Oh. Continuously? Repeatedly. Philip used to get browned off. Every time Jack Taverham threw a party, he couldn't use his bedroom. He used to push off somewhere else. All night sometimes. Oh. And no, I don't know where. Have you told the police this? I've answered every question they've asked. <sighs> if only your friends would do as much, Fran. I honestly believe they may be getting themselves into real trouble by not helping. What sort of trouble? Obstructing a murder inquiry. Accessories to murder? But that may be the least of it. If there really is a murderer amongst them, they're running the most terrible risks by concealing things, however worthy their motives may be. I gather you'd like to know when Philip left that blasted party. Well, the police would. But we could tell you and you'd pass it on. If you prefer. Of course, they might come straight back to you asking supplementaries. Well, he left early. I wanted to, well, 
borrow his bedroom for a bit, so I had a look for him. I can hardly go to a policeman with that, Miss Quine, now can I? He'd be bound to want to know which girl, and it's none of his damn business. Were you surprised Philip had gone? Not particularly. I thought he might be feeling a bit off. He'd been having jabs, the whole lot for India, typhoid, typhus, polio, tetanus, you name it. Mm. I've been through that. It made me feel pretty ropey, I can tell you. No, the bat report isn't through yet. <sighs> The point is, Mike, that I didn't give Philip that course of injections. He'd made an appointment to see me on the day he was killed, but he didn't show up. The path report would tell us if he'd had the injections or not. I'll give you a ring as soon as I get it. <sighs> Philip had definitely left the party by ten, Miss Kwai. Everyone was looking for him. Why was that, Catherine? I didn't really go along with it. He was always being picked on, and this was a bit much. Well, it would have been a bit much, only Philip left early. I suppose someone warned him. And you don't want to tell me what the joke was? Even though it was you who warned him. How did you know? Well, you mustn't tell anyone it was me. Please, Miss Quay, please don't tell anyone. I'll say nothing you don't want me to, but you're going to have to tell the police yourself, Catherine. You really must help them find who murdered him. But someone killed him in the Wyndham case, so it wasn't anyone at the party. We were all in Jack's rooms till quite late. Including Jack? Jack was there the whole time, right to the end. Which was? About half past one. And this practical joke you didn't approve of? Someone was going to knock Philip's face accidentally on purpose and give him a nosebleed. That would have been funny. Well, he had a thing about blood. Jack once cut himself shaving and Philip actually fainted. I didn't think it was fair. I'm glad you warned him, Catherine. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Miss Kai, I have a bone to pick with you. Professor Wiley, I didn't know you were back. Uh, landed at 8.30 this morning. I've just got back to the flat. Now, I want it returned, and at once, please, Miss Kai. It what? Oh, please, don't play the innocent, Miss Kai. You've removed one of my books while I was abroad, and I wish it returned. Immediately, please, Miss Kai. The safety of my property is your responsibility. Professor Wiley, I assure you I haven't the faintest idea what you're referring to. I can't imagine what interest the volume would hold for you. It's of interest only to scholars, but it's invaluable beyond price. Professor Wiley, please wait till I get home tonight. Then Fran Bullion and I will help you look for it. I'm sure it's somewhere in the flat. Now, please don't distress yourself any further. Everything will be all right, I'm certain. Can I help you? Um, I'm here on the off chance. I was passing and you seemed a bit quiet. Could you fit in a cut and blow dry for me without an appointment? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Our stylist has had some rather bad news. Tracy? Yes, Mrs Pringle? Do you think you can cope? Uh, if, if you're not well, it honestly doesn't matter. I can come back another time. No, I can manage. It'll give me something else to think about. Please, over here. Right. <clears throat> Cheer up, it's probably not as bad as you think. <laughs> Tracy, love, you left to go off sick. I'm so sorry, madam. Please bear with us. Tracy's boyfriend just... They been murdered! They bloody murdered him! Oh, oh, no. Philip. How do you know? I'm a nurse at his college. Then you must be the one who was going to see that day. Only... <sighs> Come on, let me walk you home. <laughs> I live in the flat upstairs, top floor. <laughs> then let's go up, eh? I'll make you a cup of tea. You see, we're unisex here. Philip came in for a haircut, and then he asked if I wanted to go to the pictures, and then we went out together. He used to come back here sometimes. Tracy, did you see him last Wednesday? Oh, yes. Well, he got here quite late and we went to bed. I thought he'd stay till morning, but he said he had to go. He went about midnight. If only I'd made him stay, he'd be alive now. Tracy, Philip was supposed to see me that day to start on a course of inoculations, but he didn't show. Do you know why? Yes. You see, I collected the injections for him on Tuesday, but when the time came to go across to your surgery, he couldn't find the chemist bag. He said he thought that stuck-up prig he shared with had hidden it as a joke. But he hadn't. And then the two of them went round knocking at doors and one of the girls had it. 
She'd been in their rooms earlier and picked it up by mistake. You see, she just collected a prescription herself, but it was in her bag. So why didn't he come over to my surgery then? Were you gone by then? Phil was worried. The first jabs had to be given on Wednesday so that he could have the booster before he left for India. And that Jack Tavram said he didn't need a nurse. One of the medical students could give it. So they found someone to inject the stuff. Do you know who? Someone called Felicity. It's the same as my best friend at school. But that was why he was so late. So what time did he turn up here? Oh, ten, quarter past. And he left about twelve? I couldn't stop him. He said he had something he had to do. A little night work, he called it. He said it was important. And that was the last I saw of him. I'm afraid that little job in the middle of the night was a spot of breaking and entering. That library is stuffed full of valuable books. Oh, but Mike, this is just a, a lad from Yorkshire. How could he dispose of famous books like those in the Wyndham collection, I asked Someone you. was using him. Someone, perhaps, who wanted particular books. <sighs> perhaps is the right word. Could we have missed it, Professor? Should we start again? This is no good. There's no point. It isn't here. The three of us have been over every book in the place. How could we have missed a great calf-bound quarter with Bartholomew gold tool down the spine? Well, you must tell the police. Then get their help to alert booksellers to the theft. Yes, the police. Of course. I need a phone. I, I must get to a phone. We were back in the master's lodge while Sir William made a further effort to argue Lord Goldhooper out of the restrictive conditions to his bequest. <laughs> yeah, I've been speaking to some of my scientific colleagues, Lord Goldhooper, and they feel that you may have the wrong picture about scientific theory and practice, to some extent, at least. I think not, Master. But I'm certainly willing to hear what they say. <laughs> My colleagues understand your preference for hard as opposed to theoretical science. Yes. But they point out that scientific knowledge doesn't usually advance step by step through mm. pure empirical deduction. Someone gets a hunch, guesses what the truth might be, and then, of course, one sets up experiments to test whether it is so. Yeah. It's hard to set up experiments in the absence of a theory to test. If the conditions you impose on your bequest are too restrictive, they could actually deter hard scientific discovery. Lord Goldhooper seemed thoughtful as once more, following long-established custom, we left the hall to cross Fountain Court to where port and dessert awaited us in the combination room. It was a night of bright stars, and Lord Goldhooper, less familiar than his chilled hosts with the effect of moon and starlight on the glories of the quadrangle, lingered beside the great basin of the fountain. The water jets had been turned off at midnight, and the surface of the basin was glass smooth. Reluctantly but politely, the party paused beside the pool. Roger Rumbolt drew his gown across his dress shirt. Crispin Mountnessing stamped on the worn flags. Lord Goldhooper opened his mouth as though to make some comment, but not a syllable emerged as something surfaced in the pool. The moon sailed from behind a cloud and showed us what it was. The body of a young woman, her hair drawn in strands across her face, her skirt ballooning among the lily leaves. Like a green and pallid Lady of Shalott, she floated among the reflected stars. Ooh. Yes? Uh, what is it? Uh, come in. Wakey, wakey. Uh, Roger. Ah, good morning, Imogen. You asked to be woken early. Is 6.45 early enough? Yes, yes, thank you. I uh, couldn't sleep anyway. My sofa doesn't make the most comfortable of beds. 
Oh, my God, last night. The police, mm. all those questions. And that poor girl. You know, for a terrible moment, I thought it was a particular friend of mine, Fran Bullion. Whereas it was only Felicity Marshall. Roger, that's unworthy of you. I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the police have cordoned off Fountain Court. I suppose we'll soon know whether it was accident, suicide, or whether the St Agatha killer has struck again. Roger, I must get up. Thanks for the loan of the bed. A godsend. I couldn't have faced that journey home. Now, I really must get up. Ah. I'll take these sheets down to the students' laundrette for you. I'll see you in hall for breakfast, OK? Oh, oh, hello, Emily. You're up early. Can't sleep. Still upset about Philip. Why on earth should anyone think I'd give a damn about him? He was a rat, Miss Quay. Oh, that's harsh. Do you really mean it? A pest. Scuttling about where he wasn't wanted. That's what rats do. You know what happens to rats? Philip was a nuisance to Jack Tavern. Is that what you mean? Emily, you must realise that Jack's disappearance looks very bad. If I knew where he was, do you think I'd be moping round here? Oh, I'm sick of your pretend sympathy and your leading questions. You may have got round some of the others, but you don't fool me. Anyone here? Oh, Mike, thank God you've come. Listen to this. It was on my answer phone when I got in this morning. Oh, Miss Quay, it's Felicity Marshall. I need some help. I'll come and talk to you tomorrow. Only I need to tell someone this right now. It may be my fault. I forgot to check the seals. I'm really frightened. Forgot to check the what? But it sounds like seals. How did she die, Mike? Was it accidental? Or, or perhaps suicide? Pray not. Signs of a struggle. Bruising where she was held under. It's murder. And I'd say this recording confirms it, wouldn't you? It looks bad. She knew something about Philip Skello's death. Something so dangerous to the murderer that she had to be silenced. Oh. Imogen Kwai. Oh, Imogen, thank goodness I've reached you. You don't happen to know where Professor Wiley is, do you? I I'm at a reception packed with bigwigs, all waiting to hear his bank's lecture, and he hasn't turned up. Someone's been round to your house, but there's no-one there. He's simply disappeared. Have you any ideas? <sighs> uh, he's in a funny state, Lady B. He he's lost or been robbed of an important book. He he's very upset. <laughs> upset enough to thumb his nose at the bank's lecture? He's manoeuvred for years to be invited, or so William tells me. Oh, you know, this is going to be very, very embarrassing. Come in, Fran. Oh, you do look down. Coffee? Please. Imogen, I must talk to you. Here. Yeah. Now, sit down. What's all this about? I can't tell you how I hate this. Oh, but poor Felicity. You remember how you asked me to try to get people to come clean and help the police? Well... It wasn't easy because they'd all promised not to. Good God, who to? Someone. The morning after Philip was killed. They found as many of Jack's friends as they could. Not me, because I was at a lecture. Someone told them there'd been a bust-up of some kind between Jack and Philip after the party the night before, and that when Jack heard Philip had been murdered, he'd done a bunk. But why? Oh, I suppose he thought it'd be pinned onto him. Anyway... All his friends agreed to keep Mum to help him. Everyone likes Jack. But people got pressed by the police, began telling them things that they thought weren't very important. Like the time Philip left the party. Mm. Funny how time plays such an important part in all this. Yeah. And Philip losing his prescription? Right now someone's running a witch hunt to find out who told them that. Fran... Do you think that this someone you keep mentioning on the Protect Jack Committee might have killed Felicity Marshall to shut her up? Oh God, I can't believe it. But, Fran, dear, this is looking very ugly, isn't it? If people are being threatened, shouldn't you tell me who it is? I suppose... Well, it's mostly Emily. She's gaga about Jack. 
funny thing is, she hasn't got a hope. Jack doesn't give a damn about her. Sorry for dragging you away like this, but you're the first person I could think of who could identify the old fellow at a glance. He's in Addenbrooke's hospital, rambling away. Seems to have lost his memory. But I'm pretty sure it's your Professor Wiley. Where did you find him? Drummer Street bus station. Didn't know where he was going, and he didn't know where he'd come from. The memory loss seems to have been caused by a bump on the head. A fall? <laughs> Quite a fall. Concussion, from behind and above. Looks much more like assault. Possible failed attempt at murder. My God. But... Mikey's been missing three whole days. He can't have been sitting in Drummer Street all that time. Have you brought my book? I'm sorry, Professor. No, it hasn't been found. How are you feeling? Terrible. Not only is one robbed, one is incarcerated for mentioning the fact. I expect they're doing their best for you. You can leave as soon as you're well enough. Oh, I'm all right here. It's a bloody dungeon I'm complaining about. And if I've been robbed, why shouldn't I say so? Cambridge has become terrible. It's back to Tuscany for me. And my books with me. Come in, Nick. Take a seat. Now, what can I do for you? I've come to talk about Jack. Not to me, Nick. Go and tell the police. Well, please listen, Miss Quay. I'm worried about him. We all are, Nick. If you know something... I, I don't. But he phoned me last night. He was fearfully upset about Felicity. He'd read about it in the papers. Why is he scared, Nick? Is he in hiding? He had some kind of set-to with Philip that night. Then when Philip was found murdered, he was afraid it'd all be pinned on him. Well, someone killing Felicity makes it worse. I can't make him see that the only way is to come back to Cambridge and explain. Nick, what precisely do you want to tell me? He didn't say where he is, but I can guess. And if he tries to get out of the country, he'd be making it a thousand times worse. You wouldn't like to come and talk to him. Where? Felixstowe. Jack's parents have a beach hut there. Quite well equipped, really. It's where he'd hide out. Meet me at two outside the porter's lodge. Ah, Mike. Ah, please your phone, Imogen. We've just got the path report on Philip Skello. Oh. Double blow to the head. Not a bash, the result of a fall. But he didn't die from a fractured skull. Cause of death was a lethal hemorrhage inside the cranium. And the reason for that was a heavy dose of heparin administered intravenously. What? In other words, he'd been injected with an anticoagulant and he bled to death. Oh, oh dear. Well, this makes what I've got to tell you all the more important, Mike. I'm going somewhere interesting this afternoon. Oh, where's that then? No, I'm not telling the police, citizens' rights. But someone might think I needed a little minding, and um, if they did... Nick, thank God you've come. And um, Miss Quiet. Yes. I brought her along. Well, Jack, we come in? Yes, yes, of course. It's not very comfortable, I'm afraid. If you hadn't turned up, I don't know where I'd have got my next meal. Dad's frozen my account. I was going to throw myself on the mercy of the local police. Uh, this will be better. You're going to talk to Miss Quire here, and she'll witness what you say before anyone can get at you. I hope you will talk to me, Jack. Evening all. Quite a party. Mind if I join in? You're that police sergeant, aren't you? Miss Quire, how could you... This is quite despicable of you, Jack. I promise you, I had no idea. Calm so down. Miss Quai's been under police surveillance ever since we learned that Felicity Marshall phoned her on the night that she was killed. She quite specifically did not tell me what she was doing or where she was bound for. It doesn't matter, Nick. I'm glad, in a way. Can I tell you what happened, Sergeant... Parsons. Mike Parsons. <laughs> Well, fire away. It was after the party. When they'd all gone, I went out into the quad to get some fresh air. It was then I saw Philip. When was this? Oh, one, one fifteen. Anyway, he was standing in the shadows with his back to me, facing the door of the Wyndham Library. I thought he was taking a leak. Suddenly he disappeared and I saw the door of the library closing. 
I'll catch the bastard at it, I thought. Catch him at what, sir? Well, theft, of course. Nobody could have legitimate business in the window at that hour. Anyway, it explained where all his cash was coming from. Poor as a church mouse in his first term, and now state-of-the-art computer games, internet purchases, you name it. Surely there could be some other explanation. I didn't put two and two together till I saw him lurking outside the window. So I followed him to catch him at it. I saw him go up to the gallery, pick out a book, check something in a notebook, then come down and put the book on the table. Hello, Philip. Oh, my God! You gave me a fright. What the hell are you doing here? Look, get out of it. You just put that book back. You're in for it now, you know. By tomorrow, the whole college will know you're nothing but a bloody thief. You're pissed. Look, Jack, we can easily sort this out. I'll explain in the morning. Now, just get out of here, will you? Not before you give me that book. Come on. Let go of it. You do it. Let go. We were both tugging at it, but I couldn't get a grip. So I shoved him as hard as I could. He fell over and cracked his head on the corner of the table. And then again on the marble floor. He lay there, bleeding, but his eyes were open. Jack? I'm feeling terribly dizzy. I don't think I can get up. Don't try. Stay there, I'll get some help. Be quick. Be quick as you can. I ran out to get Felicity Marshall. She's a third-year medic. Why not the night porter? Well, if the authorities were called, Philip would be in dead trouble. I thought we could sort it out ourselves. And then? Well, I managed to wake Felicity and she came back with me. But when we got there, we couldn't get in. The door was locked. What did you think had happened? Well, either he'd got up and left or he'd got up and bolted the door to go on raiding the shelves. Either way, we thought, he can't be badly hurt. So? We went back to my room for a whiskey. When Felicity saw the blood all over my shirt front, she went a bit pale. She insisted we went back to the Wyndham. We knocked on the door and called out as loud as we dared, but there was no answer. So we had a quick drink and went to bed. Are you going to charge me with murder? Not up to me, sir. You'll have to wait and see. Imogen, thought you'd like to know. We've made an arrest. Ah, oh, let me guess. Emily Stody. Good God. Are you a witch or something? How'd you get onto that? How did you? Handsome Jack, under some pressure, admitted that when Philip's missing prescription was found, it was Emily who had it. Mm. Now, what put you onto her? Access to heparin. She's a vet. I asked a friend in the vet school. They've got a project going on anticoagulants. <laughs> You're a marvel. I'm coming over. You can tell me how you see this whole nasty business. Well... Emily Stody had a, an unrequited passion for Jack Taverham. Jack set up this so-called joke to give Philip a nosebleed and have him faint at the sight of his own blood. Hmm. Emily thought she'd curry favour by improving on it. Heparin in Philip's bloodstream would make the nosebleed spectacular. And her opportunity came when she found Philip's jabs in the chemist's bag just lying around. Exactly. Only it all went wrong. And Emily found she'd led her hero into killing someone. She knew why Philip had died from a simple fall. No wonder she was hysterical the next day. And then Felicity Marshall guessed the truth. And was desperate to tell me. By silencing her, Emily would be protecting both herself and Jack, chiefly herself. And what was she doing, washing clothes so early in the morning? Were they muddy from a struggle in the lily pool? <laughs> you, 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 you've lost me. Is this another little bit of lucky deduction? <laughs> it's just that I met Emily in the laundrette, washing clothes, the morning after Felicity died. I see. <sighs> That's what I know. Now, it's your turn. <laughs> Are you sitting comfortably? Mm hmm Philip got fed up with the party and went off to see Tracy. He came back after one and went straight to the Wyndham. He picked the lock, went in and looked for a particular book that his contact wanted. Then things happened as Jack said. Have you a theory as to how the door came to be locked when Jack went back with Felicity? Has it occurred to you that Jack might be lying? Perhaps he didn't go to fetch help. Perhaps he just went back to bed, not caring a damn. Perhaps, Mike, you and I might just go and have a word with our eminent Wyndham librarian, Crispin Mount Nessing. I've had a thought. On the night of the calamity, 
I'd been spending the evening with the dean. He had some rather good brandy, and we stayed up very late talking. But when I finally left... When him, was this, sir? Almost two o'clock. I had to pass the library door on my way back to my rooms. As I did so, I tried the door, a sort of nervous reflex, and I found it open. So I locked it. You just locked it? You didn't go in? No, Imogen, I didn't. I assumed it was open because I'd forgotten to lock it. It's happened before, more than once, I'm afraid, and it shouldn't happen at all. It's a breach of the terms of the bequest. So you decided to say nothing about it? What happened to the notebook? Nova et Antica Cosmologia? It's back in its proper place, up there in the gallery. I didn't mean that book, Crispin. I meant the notebook that Philip had, according to Jack Taverham. I found no notebook. Only a corpse. Ah, Imogen. Uh, Just the person I was looking for. Can you spare a moment? Of course, Lady B. Um, let, let's walk over to my office. Oh, my dear, I'm delighted the police have closed the case, but I'm very upset about young Philip Skello. It's taken for granted that he was stealing books from the college, and I don't think there's a shred of proof. I'm with you entirely, Lady B. But the worst of it is that the college council has decided not to send anyone to Philip's funeral. What? I think that's monstrous. <sighs> well, the college council can't dictate to me, and I've decided to attend. Only for you. And I was hoping you'd share the driving. Say no more. My husband's all cut up about this stealing business, Miss Quay. And it seems wrong to me, too. I just don't think our Philip were a thief. Nor do I, Mrs. Skello. Thank you for that. But even if he was, I'd gladly have him serving 20 years if that meant he was still alive. I'm grieving for my son, Miss Quay. But can you guess what else? Tell me. The daughter-in-law I'll never have. You see, I did so want a daughter. But I couldn't have any more after Philip. My husband never did understand. But I used to think, well, never mind. I'll have a daughter-in-law someday. And now I never will. Just tip the Tia Maria into the coffee, Imogen. <laughs> you won't regret it. If you say so. Hmm. Now, what's this interesting little matter of yours? I was researching some 18th century letters while you were away. Oh. And I thought, Imogen said time was important. I wonder what she'll make of this. You see, what puzzled me was the way they wrote their dates around the middle of the century. How do you mean? Well... They started dating their letters something like uh, the 10th of March, 1752 stroke 1753. First, I thought perhaps they weren't sure about the year. But so many people did it that I thought there must be more to it. Uh, and is there? Oh, yes. 1752 was the year that England adopted the Gregorian calendar. Oh, yes, of course. H hadn't the old system got so skew with that they had to chop out some days? Mm. 11. <laughs> So the 2nd of September was followed by the 14th. People thought they were being robbed of 11 days of their life oh. and cheated of 11 days' pay. Oh, interesting. Mm. So so to celebrate the true anniversary of any event before the change, we should move the date 11 days on. Wyndham's death, for example, was on January the 8th, 1700, but the true tricentenary fell on January the 19th, 2000. Oh, but Imogen, that's not the only change that happened in 1752. Oh, mm -hmm. The law that removed the 11 days also reformed the calendar. It changed the way we calculate the year. What on earth do you mean? OK. Well, up to and including 1752, the year began on March the 25th, Lady Day, uh -huh. and ended the following March the 24th. But as part of the calendar reforms, it was decreed that 1752 would end on the 31st of December, not in the following March. Uh, hold it. Is what you're saying that what we now call January 1752 started life as January 1751, the tenth month of the previous year? In other words, that it was still 1751? Yes, and in any dated document going back for hundreds and hundreds of years, when you see a January, February or March, the year is a year earlier than what we now reckon it. So, the Wyndham bequest, which dates from Christopher Wyndham's death on the 8th of January 1700... Doesn't. What they call January 1700 
is what we now call January 1701. Oh. The tricentenary doesn't happen until next January. January 2001. After that, Master, it all fell into place. I went back to the Skellows and Philip's mother looked out his bank statements. She helped me trace a cheque for a thousand pounds back to a firm of solicitors in the town. I went to see the chief partner and it was what I'd suspected. They were the trustees of the Wyndham bequest. Ah. Good God. They'd been alerted to the fact that an audit was due before January the 19th, 2001, according to our modern calendar. Who alerted them? I'll come to that. Anyway, Philip was well known in the town, the first to have won a scholarship to St Agatha's. Mm. Who more obvious to appoint as auditor? Oh, yes. That's what he was about the night he was killed. Uh, Only he discovered a discrepancy. What sort of a discrepancy? He discovered, Lady B, that the copy of the Cosmologia on the shelves of the Wyndham case was the wrong copy. How do you mean, the wrong copy? It was the edition by Aldous Bartholomew, published in 1708, after Wyndham's death. There were two Bartholomews, Ricardo and Aldous, father and son. The edition Philip found had been stolen from Professor Wiley and substituted for the volume in the Wyndham. But why, for heaven's sake? And by whom? Uh, this is the difficult bit. Master, it all started when you began to rejoice that the audit was out of time, because, as we now know, it wasn't. Mm. There was still a year to run. This someone knew that and decided to play a trick on Crispin Mount Nessing. This someone stole, I, I expect he'd say borrowed, an edition of the Cosmologia by Aldous Bartholomew, published after Wyndham's death, and put it alongside the legitimate one feeling pretty sure that Crispin wouldn't notice. And that's the book Professor Wiley lost. Exactly. Then this someone did a little research, tracked the trust Wyndham set up to carry out the audits in perpetuity, and jogged the firm's memory. And I suppose we can deduce that the mysterious perpetrator was Roger Rumble. Oh, well, he and Crispin Mount Nessing never concealed their mm -hmm. dislike of each other. It must have mm -hmm. seemed like a jolly jape which would thoroughly discomfort his rival. So, where has Professor Wiley's edition been all this time? Crispin concealed it. When he unlocked the library that morning, it was Professor Wiley's later Bartholomew lying next to Philip's body. He found two other things that shocked him as well. A second key to the library and Philip's notebook with a complete listing of the Wyndham volumes. Oh. He realised at once that Philip had been conducting the third audit. So he took the right Bartholomew from the shelves and laid it on the floor. Then he hid the later edition, the key and the notebook. <laughs> oh, poor Crispin. When Professor Wiley reported the loss, Crispin must have been terrified. Poor Crispin. He lured the professor to a meeting and locked him up somewhere damp and dark. I think he must have clobbered the old fellow as well to stop him ranting away. Of course. There is a disused undercroft in the Wyndham wing. <sighs> Who knows about all this, Imogen? Besides Roger Rumbold and Crispin Mount Nessie? Mm. Only we three, Master. I'm going to call an emergency meeting of the College Council. I rather think we shall have to dispense with the services of both our librarians. <laughs> Skello? Yes? It's Imogen. Imogen Kwai. Oh. I have some news for you. I told you all about Tracy. Well, she's here with me. It's just been confirmed. She's pregnant. And she very much wants to have the baby. Oh. Philip's baby. Oh! Oh, Miss Kwai! What can I say? Oh, she must come and see us as soon as possible. Oh! Do you think I could have a word with her? Yes, of course. Here she is. In the Wyndham case by Jill Peyton Walsh, 
Carolyn Pickles played Imogen Kwai, and Richard Derrington, Mike Parsons. Sir William was played by Geoffrey Dench, Lady Buckmote by Marlene Sidaway, Fran Bullion by Tracy Wiles, Mount Nessing by Charles Collingwood, and Mrs. Skello by Gillian Goodman. Ian Brooker was Lord Goldhooper, Tom George, Nick, Claire Corbett, Emily and Tracy, and Jasmine Hyde, Catherine and Felicity. Jack was played by Thomas Arnold, Philip by Alex Trinder, and Roger by Martin Reed. Other parts were played by members of the company. The Wyndham case was dramatised for radio by Neville Teller and directed in Birmingham by Peter Leslie Wilde.